morning, everyone. We will begin in just a minute. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I am Laura Whitlock, the Director of Marketing and Innovation at Watson Gloves. Thank you all for joining us today on our webinar on the ANSI ISCA 138, What You Need to Know About the Impact Standards. I would like to introduce our two presenters today. Rodney Taylor is the Director of Sales US for Watson Gloves and also serves on the Board of Trustees of the ISCA and Chair of the ISCA 138 Workgroup. Christina Young is the Product Development Manager at Watson Gloves and also serves on the ICA Hand Protection Product Group that is responsible for developing and maintaining hand protection standards. Throughout this presentation, if you do have any questions, please enter them into the question box on your dashboard and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. Let's begin. All right, thanks, Laura. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Really pleased to provide an update on the new ANSI ISCA 138-2019 standard today. I enjoy talking about this standard because I really believe it fills an important gap in the standards infrastructure in North America. We have EN388 in Europe, with, with whom many of you may be familiar. We have ANSI ISCA 105 in North America and Latin America. They provide guidance around cut and puncture and abrasion and chemical exposure, but there's really been no robust standard to address back of hand impacts for industrial gloves. So I'm really excited that this standard is here. Um, the ISCA was developed, uh, developed 138 to establish testing, classification, and labeling requirements for gloves that offer back of hand impact protection. And so we're going to talk about what that means during this presentation today. So here's our agenda for today. Um, we'll talk about how, how the standard works. We'll talk generally about standard development just very, very briefly. I'll move into getting into detail around the transmitted energy and the test method itself. Uh, we'll talk about product marking requirements for the standard, and then we'll transition to give Christine an opportunity to talk about new innovations relative to impact resistant gloves. So let's jump right into it. I want to start off this presentation by providing a little bit of context. Like, here's the why. Why, why do we spend all this time and effort developing this standard? Why do manufacturers of gloves put all the time and effort into getting their gloves tested and qualified versus the standard, et cetera. Well, the background is this. Hand injuries are a major problem for industry. 46% of all industry recordable incidents are to the hands, fingers, and wrists. And there's a significant cost associated with these injuries. Almost half of all industry recordable incidents uh, we said involving the hands, fingers, and wrists, and of that, almost 40% um, of those are leading to lost time incidents, that is time away from work. Not only that, it's estimated that each of these injuries can cost about $20,000. So there is quite a significant cost associated with all of these hand injuries. So, you know, we've established the reality of the high frequency of hand injuries, we've established the reality of the high cost of these injuries, there's another issue, and that is that for those who have the responsibility of specifying appropriate PPE, they have to deal with the reality that there seems to be a new back of hand impact protective glove entering the market every other day. It's true for all types of gloves, but it's definitely an issue for impact protective gloves. End users really haven't had any straightforward or reliable means to objectively compare all these different products that are on the market. And the result is a challenge for specifiers. What's the measuring stick to compare these different gloves? Um, I, I love this comment that came in from 
Dr. Lloyd Champagne, he was a hand surgeon who served as an advisor to the work group that developed this standard. The more he learned about the realities that exist for end users, and keep in mind, I mean, this guy doesn't know anything much about the safety industry, so he, he, was, he was getting a quick lesson by being a part of this work group. But the more he learned, the more he realized that PPE specifiers have a real problem. It's a very, very difficult job to kind of sort through all these different products on the market, and clearly a solution is needed. So the ISCA is the organization behind this standard. So I just wanted to make a few quick comments about the ISCA for those who might not be familiar. The ISCA is the primary industrial safety standards development organization in North America. The ISCA is linked to ANSI or the American National Standards Institute as the ISCA serves as a secretary organization for several ANSI technical standards. And for that reason, the majority of, of ISCA standards are published as joint ANSI slash ISCA standards. So I just want to make sure folks understood who the ISCA was because we'll mention the ISCA quite frequently during this call. So we've established the high frequency of hand injuries. We've established the high cost of these injuries. There is emerging data to indicate that a large percentage of hand injuries are impact related. It's true that um, oftentimes when um, there is a hand injury that would be cited or, or listed as a cut or slash injury, the actual root cause could have been an impact. An impact related injury can often present itself as a cut or a slash. While the data collection on impacts could be a lot better, and I believe it is getting better day by day, there is clearly an industry need for impact performance assessment for industrial gloves. It was clear to the ISCA that end users needed a straightforward, reliable means to make comparisons between these different gloves. So a work group was formed to draft a new standard. There were seven ISCA member companies involved I serve as the chair of that work group. We had a professional hand surgeon involved who was an advisor to the work group. And the standard is formally titled American National Standard for Performance and Classification for Impact Resistant Gloves. And that's exactly what the standard does. It classifies dorsal or back of hand impact gloves by performance. And that performance is assessed based on how much energy is dissipated from a shock wave passing through the glove material. So in this next chart, I've got an image of a pretty typical drop rig that's used for glove impact testing. The rigs can, can vary by design. They can look slightly different, but you know, the, the functions are pretty much the same between the various rigs. And I will say that um, this test method, this kind of drop rig test method, has been used for motorcycle glove testing and industrial glove standards in Europe for many, many years. So that's to say, it's a reliable, proven test method with readily available test equipment. These rigs, they aren't particularly cheap, but they are readily available. So let's walk through how this works. The first point here is that uh, there's a carriage. You can see that noted there on this chart. The carriage is free to float up and down, supported by guide wires on each side. The carriage um, houses a striker and the striker has a very specific mass and a specific geometry that's called out in the standard, that carriage, when you're ready to conduct the test, would be raised up, it'd be attached to the mechanism up above, you would place your glove sample onto that anvil, that piece of steel at the bottom there, it has a curved hemispherical surface, and when you're ready to conduct the test, you would release the carriage, it would free fall, the striker would impact the glove sample that's sitting on that hemispherical anvil. And I will make a quick point. That anvil having a hemispherical surface is really important. Because of that surface, you're able to, when you're doing the test, to be able to impact a very specific location on the glove. If you didn't have that hemispherical surface, the striker would impact multiple knuckles or multiple fingers. And that's not what we're after. We want to hit a very specific location on the test glove. The, the anvil is then connected to a load cell, which is a very precise force measurement device. 
that load cell is in turn connected to a computer so that all of the forces that are taking place during this impact are recorded. And the output is a trace of force over time. And I'll show you what, what that looks like in just a second. So if I go to the next chart, this is kind of a, a, a representation of the kind of trace that you would see as an output from the test method that's utilized in ANSI ISDA 138. You would see that over time, you would start off with no force, kind of when the test is getting started. And then as the striker impacts the test glove, you would see the forces rise very, very quickly. And then as the material settles out, you would see the forces start to trail off. During this test, what we're looking for is the peak of that curve. That peak represents the maximum amount of energy that's going to be absorbed by that glove material. And so when you want to compare two different gloves, you would conduct the test the exact same way, and then you would compare the peaks of the two curves that were generated during the test. The glove that has the lower peak transmitted force would have the higher performance. Why is that? That's because the more energy that's absorbed by the test material, the lower the peak of this curve. So as we compare different materials, we look for that lowest peak. And gloves that absorb the greatest amount of impact force gain the highest rating under ISCA 138. Why? Because lower force observed, go back to this chart here, lower force observed beneath the test sample means that more energy was absorbed by the glove material. That glove absorbed more energy and had higher performance. ISCA 138 provides three performance levels for impact gloves, levels one, two, and three, with one being the lowest performance level, three being the highest performance level, based on peak transmitted force measurements using the test method I just described. One thing to note here is that the performance levels are defined by average values or the mean of all impact locations tested. And in addition, if any one impact exceeds the all impacts value, then the glove is automatically dropped a performance level. The whole idea here is that we're trying to capture the average performance of the glove as well as the standard deviation. If you had one point in the glove where there was a weak spot or there was inadequate protection, whatever, you want that glove to be penalized for that. So we're trying to capture both the mean performance and the standard deviation of the values. When we're conducting the test, there are very specific impact locations that have to be impacted. And this chart um, indicates where those impact locations need to be. So we're testing both the fingers and the knuckles. For the fingers, you're gonna be testing either 25 millimeters from the tip of the glove or 50 millimeters from the tip of the glove. And then in addition to that, you're gonna be testing the knuckle, all four knuckles on a, on a particular glove. And I just want to make a note on how we go about assessing where you test the knuckles. To test the knuckles, you would have the test subject don the glove, put the glove on. The test subject would then grasp a bar, a bar that's 32 millimeters in diameter. And then while the test subject is grasping that bar, you would mark exactly where the peak of the knuckle is. And that way you're identifying where the knuckle is as opposed to where the impact material is. We did find that there were several gloves on the market that had back of hand impact protection that was intended to cover the knuckles, but didn't actually cover the knuckles. So uh, including this procedure into the test method, we can ensure that we're testing where the knuckle is as opposed to just where the impact uh, protective material is. Um, the impact, once the impact locations have been identified and marked, the glove is cut. You cut the glove to remove the palm side of the glove so that you're only testing the back half of the glove. So when you get done, you're going to have uh, 10 impacts for fingers and thumbs and eight impacts for the knuckles because you're testing a pair of gloves. 
Another important, important point here is that all impact testing has to be conducted by an independent laboratory. So manufacturers cannot self-certify their impact claims. Testing has to be done by an in independent test facility. There are marking requirements for the standard. There is a required pictogram mark. This slide shows the pictogram marks. And the whole idea here is that if a manufacturer is going to claim compliance to the standard, they have to apply this mark so that an end user can very quickly, very easily recognize what performance is being claimed on that particular glove. And this marking needs to be visible and legible throughout the useful life of the glove. Now, one question that comes up quite often when I, when I give this presentation is, how do I relate these transmitted forces to my real world applications? And there's really two issues that I've found that make this standard challenging to work with in the real world. And those two issues are the units being used and the idea that you're talking about forces. The big challenge in interpreting impact force results from ANSI IC 138 is that the terms are so unfamiliar. So the 138 standard uses SI units, and the SI system or system, international system of units is, is the modern metric system of measurement. And it's really the dominant system of international commerce, of trade, and of science. And so the 138 standard utilizes the SI system of units for forces and energy. For my Canadian friends, this part is not such a big deal, but for my American countrymen, this is oftentimes a disaster. In America, we really don't know how to deal with talk about kilograms, much less kilonewtons. And even if you are familiar with the SI units, the, the second point I wanted to make is you likely don't often deal with energy units. So the unit terms and the ISA 138 standard are unfamiliar to most people. So just a real quick primer here. The force unit in the, in the SI system is called the Newton. Its symbol is capital N. It's named after the famous mathematician Sir Isaac Newton, inventor of calculus and Newton's laws of motion that you may remember from your physics class. One Newton is equivalent to about 0.2248 pounds force just for uh, reference for, for my uh, American colleagues on the line. Typical impact forces that are encountered in the ISDA 138 compliant testing are over 1,000 newtons. And so to simplify, the SI system um, abbreviates 1,000 as kilo, so that 1,000 newtons is equal to one kilo. The corresponding energy unit in the SI system is the joule. So we talk about newtons for forces, but for energy, we're talking about a unit called the joule, also named after another famous math mathematician. It's an expression of the mechanical work done by pushing an object through a distance against a force. The English unit of energy is the foot pound. So one joule is equal to about 0.738 foot pounds. The test method utilized for 138 is designed to generate about five joules of energy. So when you set up your test equipment, you have to ensure that the output is five joules of impact energy. And that's all I'm gonna say about joules because you guys didn't come here for a physics lesson. So the next chart here provides a summary of the transmitted forces for performance levels in both the SI system along with the corresponding English units. And this answers one question that, that I really quite often get from my American audiences is, okay, what does four kilonewtons mean? Well, four kilonewtons, as this chart indicates, is about 900 pounds force, and you can see the other corresponding um, uh, English units for the units specified in the 138 standard. For reference, if we ran an impact test with no sample, if we just did metal striker slamming it up against metal anvil, the impact energy would be about 45 kilonewtons, so about 10,000 pounds force. 
just for reference. That kind of gives you an idea of the range of impact dissipation that's necessary to even begin to qualify for compliance to 138. So even um, to even you know, have compliance, you have to have a glove that absorbs a pretty significant amount of energy. And to get to level three, you're talking about an order of magnitude reduction in, in transmitted energy. So the last thing I want to cover here is I want to share some impact example. Another frequent question that I get is, you know, can you share some examples of a four kilonewton impact or a six and a half kilonewton impact? And, and that, that's what I'm going to try to attempt to do here. Now, an important consideration before I get into that is that, you know, when you're evaluating impact forces, it's really important to consider two things. One, you got to consider the, the contact area. And secondly, you need to consider the hardness of the materials that are being involved. So, for example, a, a professional football player, quarterback, can throw a football that weighs about 0.9 pounds, about 70 miles per hour. So, if you do the math, that represents about 190 joules of energy. Well, guess what? That's about the same amount of energy from firing a 22 caliber round into a target. So a 22 caliber round is about 0 .006 pounds traveling at 850 miles an hour. You do the math, it's pretty much the same amount of impact energy. But you gotta ask yourself, would you rather be hit by a football or be hit by the bullet? The impact energies may be the same, but the contact area on the football is much, much larger and the hardness is much, much lower. So the overall damage potential for the football is much, much lower than the bullet. And I say all this to say that these are important considerations in the real world. In other words, you need to conduct a hazard assessment in order to select the appropriate glove for your application needs. Because all these considerations need to be uh, taken in mind. So this chart, I am uh, trying to provide just an order of magnitude example of the kind of impact energies you might be experiencing relative to 138. So in this graphic, I've got some examples. They're just for illustrative purposes only. You, you gotta keep in mind the contact area. You gotta keep in mind the hardness of the materials of being involved. But for example, if we're talking about something around three kilonews, which gets you into the level three performance range, you're talking about 680 pounds of force, and that's about the typical force of a boxer's punch. Right? So just a order of magnitude, you're talking about being punched in the face by a boxer, about 680 or three kilonewtons of force. At about four and a half kilonewtons, or a thousand, a little over a thousand pounds force, that's about the force of a typical hammer strike. So you're trying to hit a nail, you miss, you hit your thumb, that's about four and a half kilonewtons of impact force. And then moving up in increasing severity, the force of a 180 pound person falling about 10 feet, well, that's about eight kilonewtons or about 1800 pounds force. Those are all kind of illustrative forces in the range of the kind of impact forces we're dealing with in the 138 standard. And then just another point of reference, if you uh, imagine kind of the, the crack that you hear when a professional baseball player hits a ball, that's about 35 kilometers or about 8,000 pounds of force. So again, these are just uh, for illustrative purposes only just to kind of give you some point of reference for the kind of forces that we're dealing with in 138. And, and I hope these examples are helpful to you. So, in conclusion, uh, the standard has been published, 138 has been around now for a little over a year. Um, it will remain an independent standard for, for the time being. Um, it does provide three performance levels, levels one, two, and three. It includes both an evaluation of fingers and knuckles. It does require third-party lab testing, so no more self-certification of test results. And there is a pictogram labeling requirement per the standard. And I'll just finish up and say that I, I really believe that this standard 
can be a very, very powerful tool to improve hand safety performance. Um, and I, I would say that end users do need to carefully assess the appropriate impact performance level for their application needs, conduct a hazard assessment, and solicit the expertise of a safety professional. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Christine. Thanks so much, Rodney. What an excellent presentation to help shed some light on um, the various kind of aspects of the impact standard. I'm sure for a lot of um, our um, customers out there, um, they're probably asking themselves, well, how do we establish what level of um, hand protection we need for our particular task? So when the ANSI ISBA 138 impact standard was launched back in 2019, um, our team really um, went out and worked very closely with um, health and safety experts in a lot of large industrial um, fields, including oil and gas and mining, to kind of help educate and to establish um, what level of impact protection would be the most appropriate um, that would uh, help protect from the uh, majority of uh, the workers in the largest amount of um, tasks that they would be required to do on the job site. Um, so after assessing the hazards against um, the impact rating, as Rodney really um, explained to us really well, um, it was decided to start on a lot of the major industrial sites at an impact level two. Um, and that is what has been established now in a lot of our major end user job sites. And for the last year, uh, our customers have been using gloves at this current level, and uh, so far so good. Uh, it's been working out very well for us. Um, and so for the next few slides, we're just going to share with you some of the new innovations that we have uh, that focus on the various uh, impact levels. When we were establishing our new uh, impact uh, level, or sorry, ANSI ISCA 138 um, uh, rated gloves, we wanted to make sure that we had gloves in every category. So the first category that you see here is in our leather uh, glove category. These gloves also work in conjunction with other safety features such as cut resistance. So for this particular glove, it has a full grain goatskin uh, palm and back. It also has a full sock um, A5 cut resistant uh, liner. But as you can see, we focused on full dorsal uh, impact protection uh, on the fingers, on the knuckle area, the top of the thumb, as well as the uh, wrist area. And uh, this is our 547 TPR Van Goat. It is also available in winter styles as well as gauntlet versions as well for additional forearm protection. The next product that we have here is in our seamless knit category. And this is our 357 TPR Stealth Dog Fight. Again, this features an A5 cut resistant, um, full uh, cut resistant liner, sandy nitrile palm dip. But again, you see on the back of the hand, it has um, our full dorsal uh, TPR protection, which will pass, at, that has passed at, at an ISDA um, 138 impact level two. And these uh, seamless knit gloves have also, we also have them in a range from um, an A3 to an A7 cut resistance as well. Next slide. Uh, sorry, next slide. So the uh, next category that we have features some of the uh, impact level three, um, ISCA 138 impact level three protection gloves. So the first one we have here um, is our 585 Commander. Uh, when we uh, were developing these gloves, we partnered with D3O uh, and utilized their uh, impact additive in our TPR to be able to help us reach an ISCA 138 impact level three while providing a slightly lower profile in the TPR and also still maintaining that flexibility and dexterity as well. So for this particular, for this particular glove, it also features an oil and water resistant palm and a really comfortable spandex back. And we've also partnered with Wounded Warriors as well in that every um, uh, por portion of uh, the proceeds from the sale will be donated to the Wounded Warriors Foundation. The next glove in the um, ISCA Impact Level 3 category is our Shock Trooper. 
This is our ultimate in hand protection. So this glove provides not only an ISCA 138 impact level three full back of hand and top of thumb uh, impact protection, but also provides you with um, water and oil resistance um, in the, the treated goatskin leather. It also has a vibration dampening palm, as well as a full soft A7 cut resistant liner as well. Moving on to fall, uh, fall of 2020, we have some new products that we will be launching shortly. These will be coming to market in a few months. The first item here is our 9398 TPR Stealth Triple Threat. Uh, we know that in the wintertime, um, among um, many hazards such as impact and uh, cut hazards, there's also the um, uh, hazard of, of wet, um, in wet conditions. So this particular glove, has a full uh, dip nitrile coating, which will provide that waterproof uh, resistance, uh, water resistancy, as well as a sandy nitrile palm uh, dip that'll help you with the grip. And then again, as mentioned, it has an A5 cut resistant liner uh, with an acrylic liner on the inside to keep you warm. And then the full back of hand dorsal uh, TPR impact protection that will provide an ISBA impact level two. The next glove we have that's new for winter 2020 is our 9456 Hammers. This one is great for anyone per that needs not only impact protection, not only cut protection and cold protection, but also will provide you with chemical protection as well. So this particular glove is a full gauntlet uh, PVC full zip glove with uh, an acrylic liner for warmth. It also has the dorsal impact protection as you can there that has been tested to an ISCA 138 impact level two. And it also has a full sock A5 cut resistant liner. And it has been rated um, under the EMC 74-1 uh, to protect against six chemicals as well. So just a little bit of supporting marketing material that is available for all of you as well, just to share with um, just to, if you want to learn a little bit more about our standards, we have a flyer here that features uh, the uh, new impact standard as well as uh, the markings that are required and the levels of uh, impact protection. And also on our website, if you wanted to uh, learn more about our products, available products, there is an icon featured here that you can click on. And in the next slide, the, uh, it will take you to a page that will allow you to choose between all of our um, ISBA impact level two gloves as well as level three gloves. And so once you click on your chosen impact um, standard, it will bring you to all of the styles that will feature that particular in impact standard. Uh, another thing that we do have available is an impact uh, protection guide which will again uh, is available for download and is available in French as, uh, as well. So this is all on our website. So please, we encourage you to come visit our website and download any of these um, marketing materials to share with your, uh, your team. And Perfect. So that concludes our webinar today. We will ask if there's any questions, please type them into the question box on your dashboard and we'll be able to answer a few. So we do have a bunch of questions that came in here. Rodney, for the first question here, how would you suggest a company go about assessing the risk at their locations and determining the appropriate level of protection required? Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I would say this. I would say that the, the shorter answer is, is conduct a hazard assessment. Utilize this qualified safety professional. I, I really can't underscore that enough. Um, as manufacturers, um, we really don't have the capability of, of recommending PP for a given end user application. We produce the highest quality products that we possibly can, but it's really physically impossible to produce one article that meets all end use application needs. So that said, it's really up to end users to select appropriate PP based on a, based on a hazard assessment conducted by a qualified safety professional. Great, thank you. Another question here for Rodney. How often are the standards updated and or changed? Is this based over a period of time, for example, five years, or is this based on technology improvements? 
Well, it's, it's a little bit of both, but I will say that um, the ISDA mandates that their standards uh, follow a prescribed revision cycle. So for example, you know, 105 and 138, um, there's a mandatory requirement that they be revised after five years. And so for example, the 105 product group uh, just met yesterday because they are beginning the work to uh, consider revisions to the 105 standard. Now, that being said, if there is some, some major change in technology or, 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 or some, um, something that would, would, would require that uh, the product groups make an earlier evaluation than prescribed by the revision cycle, that would certainly be considered by the ISCA. But generally, revisions are going to follow the prescribed revision cycle. Okay, thank you. Another one here for Rodney. When we are talking about impacts, what about high frequency impacts like vibration? Are those are there standards that deal with that? Uh, I would say that um, there is a standard. There is an ISO standard that deals with vibration. Um, there is not um, an ISEA standard for vibration at this point. Um, vibration is a very, very challenging engineering problem. And um, I think even though there is an ISO standard, I, I think it's pretty well recognized that there are some challenges and limitations with that standard, but it is all that we have today. I can tell you that the ISCA is evaluating uh, whether or not to produce a work group to begin consideration for um, a North American version of, an, of a vibration standard. So we'll just all have to keep our uh, our eyes peeled for uh, developments there. The next question here is for Christina. Why do we start at level two and not level one? Uh, it's a great question. So when we were uh, learning more and more about the new ISDA 138 um, hand protection uh, impact standard, uh, we wanted to make sure that we were working in lockstep with a lot of the um, big industrial end users. And when we started to assess the hazards that uh, most commonly occurred on the job site, uh, we wanted to focus a lot of our products uh, to be able to meet those uh, hand protection needs. And so uh, by working very closely with the health and, health and safety officers at these uh, major industrial job sites, we established that impact level two would probably be the best place to start that would be able to protect the majority of the workers at, during the, uh, in the majority of the tasks that they were doing. So that is why the, uh, our focus uh, when we had launched a lot of these products was to start at an impact level two. Great, okay, thank you. That's just for Rodney. Wouldn't cutting the glove in half prior to impact test affect the final test result? Um, the, the whole intent is that you, you, you really want to evaluate the performance of the back of hand material. And there are some gloves that, that have palm surfaces that are, that are quite thick. And you didn't want the, the material on the palm side of the glove to be absorbing some of that impact energy and thereby artificially inflating the performance of the back of hand of the glove. We only want to test the back of hand material uh, per, the, per the 138 standard and not dilute the results by also testing the palm. Great. For Rodney, why is third party testing required? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, and, and a lot of folks will say manufacturers can still certify the results under 105. Why can't they do that under 138? And there's actually some irony in that question based on the challenges with self-reporting under 105, but the short answer is we really wanted to bring the highest level of consistency to test results. That's why we chose to require third-party testing. In an ideal state, uh, personally, I would have liked to have seen only one lab that was approved for testing, but um, we, we, that's going to violate some of our operating principles. It's going to raise costs. It's going to lower access to testing. But ultimately, we, we wanted to ensure that we could have the most reliable and consistent results possible. So we required that third-party labs be uh, the ones that certify results. Ronnie, doesn't EM388 have an impact assessment? And how does it differ from the IACA 138? Yes, that is correct. Um, 
EN388 does include an impact assessment. For those who aren't familiar, EN388 is the European corollary to 105. It includes an impact assessment that is based on impact testing. It, it uses very similar test equipment. But the challenges and, and the two major differences are that one, EN388 only tests the knuckles, while ISCA 138 requires testing both knuckles and fingers. And, and this is really important because the data seems to indicate that most industrial injuries are occurring at the fingers and more likely at the fingertips. So only testing the knuckles is a big mess. The other point is that EN388 only provides a pass-fail rating. It's really difficult to differentiate performance with only a P or an F. So ISCA 138 provides three performance levels to better differentiate performance of impact gloves. Ronnie, any idea if temperature conditions, hot or cold, impact the amount of force that is absorbed by the TPR? It certainly can. I mean, it, it's a function of what material is being utilized on the back of hand. Generally speaking, for elastomeric materials, um, they are going to be less responsive in colder environments. I will tell you this, that um, there are conditioning requirements per the standard. The standard calls out that the testing has to be done under very, very specific conditions. The gloves have to be preconditioned. Uh, the atmosphere has to be something like 73 degrees Fahrenheit, 50% relative humidity for 24 hours prior to testing. So all test results are in that context. All test results are based on the conditioning requirements of the standard. If you need to understand how a glove is going to perform in cold weather conditions, separate testing is going to be required. That is not explicitly included in the 138 standard. Thanks. It looks like I have a couple more questions here. Since the NCICA 138 was introduced, what industries have adopted the standard the fastest? Rodney. Yeah. I I would say, I'll, I'll take a whack at that. I'll say um, the standard has filled a gap in the industry. I, I, I think the adoption rates of the standard have been very high. Um, the ISCA really doesn't have any direct means, nor do manufacturers have any direct means to assess the adoption rate. There's, there's no governmental monitoring or, or required reporting by end users, so any insights on adoption are anecdotal. But there are industry sectors that do seem to have a higher incidence of impact-related uh, injuries. Um, with oil and gas and construction come to mind, but frankly, we've been surprised at the number of inquiries from diverse industry sectors like industrial manufacturing, heavy transportation, even prosumers like auto repair and, and, and small to mid-sized trades have expressed an interest in impact gloves. Um, it is a self-regulated market in North America, so standards adoption takes time, and, and the 138 standard is still considered brand new, but adoption has been high overall, and it, it is not just limited to specific industries. Great, thanks. And I have a question here for Christina. What about all the products before the standard came out that weren't rated? What did Watson do about those, those gloves? Um, great question. So when the um, NCIC 138 impact standard came out, we wanted to ensure that uh, we went back and uh, improved the impact resistance as per the new standard um, to make sure that the old legacy product was now compliant. So if you look at um, our product selection in some of our um, previous styles, uh, some of you may be familiar with our um, uh, 1051 breakdown or our 578 um, drill sergeant or perhaps our uh, 010 BK um, extreme. Those previously did have um, uh, TPR on the back of hand as well. So what we've done now is gone back and ensured that the new TPR that we have on anything, any product that is landing um, will meet uh, ISDA standards at an impact level too. So we were very, very diligent in, in going back to uh, making sure that our, our legacy products also now met the new standards. Great, thank you. And I just have time for one last question here for Rodney. Will the 138 standard be combined with the 105 standard? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, not in the midterm. 
Um, the 105 product group just met yesterday and this issue did come up. Uh, 105 is coming up for mandatory five-year review as we discussed earlier, but the decision was made yesterday to keep 105 separate from 138 for the time being. We will revisit this topic when 138 comes up for review in a few years, but for now they will be two separate independent standards. Great, thank you. So that concludes our webinar for today. I would like to thank you all for joining us, and I hope you learned a lot of valuable information on how to pick the right level of impact for the task at hand. We will be sharing this recorded webinar. Uh, however, if there are any additional questions, please email info at watsongloves.com or please reach out to your sales rep. Thanks again, Rodney and Christina, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.